Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Guild Hall. I'm Andrea Grover, the executive director. Um, you're welcome to move up if you'd like to and fill in the seats up front if you feel like it, no pressure. Um, so this is the final installment of the Hamptons Institute. I'm really proud of this program. It started about 10 years ago. Um, it was spearheaded by Mickey Strauss. Um, and it was a way to address contemporary issues that are facing both the local community and the national and even global community. And someone who was here a few weeks ago said, you know, this isn't the first time that Guildhall has used its space as a platform for these conversations. Apparently, we used to have um, you know, candidate debates here. There was a series called Hot Topics. Does anyone remember that? Yes, okay, someone said yes. I think it was in the 80s or the 90s, but it was a precursor to the Hampton Institute, but we really were founded as a kind of town hall for the arts where these com kinds of conversations were very much at home. Um, and the idea is that you walk away with some inspiration to be activated, to take part in um, your civic community and beyond. So the first program we had of this series this summer was Youth Activism Could Save the Planet. How many people were here for that? Okay. Um, and we have another youth activist on stage tonight, and I actually think that they're really the key to change because I've sat through so many climate panels and I haven't really made any big changes, but after the one that was three weeks ago, I called up a solar company. We're, com we're gonna be converting to solar at my house, gonna be converting to electric cars, and I'm also organizing a jitney to New York for the climate protest on September 20th, and I'm sponsoring youth to go with me. So. <laughs> so, so that's the kind, I was inspired by the program right here at Guild Hall, and I hope that you tell me your story of what you take away from these events. So I really want to thank our sponsors, our lead sponsors for the Hamptons Institute are the Hayden Family Foundation, Susan and Stephen Jacobson, Joyce Menchel, Alice Netter, and Layla Strauss with additional support from Cal Carol Liebenson and Citarella. Um, Citarella does a reception after all of these events. Ours will be indoors today, just at the other end of the building. Um, I also wanna thank Judith Hope, uh, Gordian Rocky, Linda James and Minerva Perez who, Perez, who were sort of like the special ops on putting together this particular program on um, the future of women in leadership. Um, and Tracy Marshall, who has put together the series, as well as Sheridan Caloria, who has advised us. Um, I think this is gonna be an exceptional panel. We have a powerhouse a group of women here. Um, we have seen the numbers of women being elected rise steeply from 2018 to 2019, where it was like around 3% in Congress in the 70s, and now we're up to 20, I think it's 23.7% in 2019, not good enough, but we're getting there. So um, please, I hope you enjoy the program. Think of questions along the way. We always do a Q&A right afterwards. Thank you. Great, well welcome. It's great to be here with all of you. I'm Cecile Richards and I have the great honor of getting to moderate this illustrious panel. And I thought maybe we'd just go down the road and everybody introduce themselves quickly and then we'll get right into the conversation, okay? I'm Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul. I'm Assemblywoman Kimberly Jean-Pierre, I represent Town of Babylon, Central Long Island. And I'm Avery Reed, student activist from California. I'm Assemblywoman Taylor Darling, I represent District 18 in Nassau County, Long Island. And I am Brett McSweeney, the president of Eleanor's Legacy, a women's political organization here in New York. So can we give it up for this fabulous panel? Thank you. Um, so we all just got to know each other, and it's really great because we have folks who've been doing politics for their entire lives, and then we have Avery, who's gonna be a first-time voter next year, uh, which is really exciting. So, um, I wanted to start out with a question that is on my mind, which is, 
it, about a year from now, we're actually going, it'll be the centennial of women's suffrage in this country. Although I think for everyone here, uh, if you don't know, you should know that that was only for white women. And of course it took many, many years before women of color also gained the right to vote. But it's, it is something somewhat incredible that a hundred years later, we're heading into one of the most important presidential elections um, in our lifetime. Uh, and that women are now the majority of voters. They are the majority of activists. Um, increasingly, they are candidates, um, and I'm sure Brett will talk about that. And one of the facts that I think is so fascinating is in this last election in 2018, women actually contributed $100 million more to candidates and campaigns than they did in 2016 when Hillary Clinton ran for president. Mm -hmm. So I know, that's how I feel. It's like, it is, it is really incredible that women are um, putting their money into, into politics, they're, they're active uh, and they're involved, and yet we still don't have political power um, in the way that we should, and we could go through all the, all the ways in which we see that every day in our lives. So I am really interested from this panel, if you had one big idea of what we can do with the next 12 months to make our democracy more reflective and to make sure that every woman in this country goes to vote, what would it be? And Avery, I'm gonna pick on you because you're the first time voter and you're talking to a lot of the people that we need to make sure do go vote next November. Yeah, okay. So from my perspective as a student, um, it is frustrating to see that people who are seniors in high school, 17 year olds, um, aren't able to vote, vote in the um, general elections. So I think if I had one big idea to increase voter participation, and especially women participation, um, would be to lower the voting age to 17. And so we have that, um, we have a proposal in California, ACA 8, which is advocating to lower the voting age to 17. And I think that if we want to have the best turnout um, for high school seniors across the country, that if we lowered that, that would show students that right after their civics course or right after their US Gov course when they're most like riled up and excited about US politics, um, that they can go straight to the voter box and you know show that excitement by a vote. And so if we lower that, we're increasing the inclusivity for people across the country. So that's my that's my big idea. Bravo. <laughs> okay, who else has an idea? Okay, I'll go next. I'll try to follow Avery's revolutionary idea of expanding democracy. Uh, and what I would say is get involved right now. There's going to be elections happening in November 2019. And these, ma these elections matter in New York. It's at the local level. You're village, your town, your county offices. And that's where the momentum builds for 2020. It's just what happened here in New York. Huge victories in Riverhead, in Hempstead, uh, electing women and electing Democratic women in 2017 helped feed the blue wave in 2018 that took over Congress. And on top of that, the rubber meets the road at the local level. And so we need to change the face of power in Albany, which we're working on. We need to change the face of power in DC, which we will be working on. But we still need to focus on these villages, towns, and counties in our cities as well. Great. And I would just add to really focusing on um, issues that are important to us women, which we like childcare, like the cost of living, um, like running your household, um, and just be more involved. And, and if you know anyone that has a child in school, I mean, it also starts down from your PTA, the local level at the school district, getting more involved. Just, you know, the cliche is all politics is local. That's true. And it starts from local and how do we build up our community? How do we build up young women in our community, starting from our school age uh, girls? It does seem like that this whole idea of like how do how do women associate voting with actually solving problems that they have, and I think uh, I was actually there was a congresswoman said to me the other day, uh, she said, you know, everybody in Congress, including the men, they agree on the issues that we care about: affordable child care, uh, family leave, um, in increasing equal pay, the minimum wage. But somehow, when it comes to divvying up the pot it's always about roads and bridges. <laughs> it's, it's not actually about the things that, for a lot of women, are really the economic difference. Um, so I think that is a really important point. Like, How do we make politics relevant uh, and make sure the issues that, that so many working women uh, deal with are, um, are actually on the agenda? What were you gonna say, uh, Assemblywoman, though? I had an idea to increase <laughs> engagement, yeah. your last question. I just got this idea 
with Avery and her grandmother, I was in the back, and um, I heard somewhere that the biggest issues we have in our community is that intergenerational breakdown. Like, we're not speaking to each other anymore. We're not sharing stories anymore. So, you know, we, we hear women's suffrage, we hear civil rights, and, and we have people who are here who can share those experiences that we love, our grandmothers, our bubbies, everybody, you know? And um, we're not tapping into that resource. So I think a PSA with some intergenerational conversations would be really fun so that people could actually, you know, understand the humane part of, of government and what happens when we don't pay attention and we don't get involved or we weren't able to get involved. So I think a PSA like that would be really, really effective. Love that. Just to answer the question, it's very hard for a politician to give a one answer to any question, <laughs> uh, but I will try, I will try. But I was just thinking, because I, I agree with everything that's been said about the power of getting involved now, as Brett talked about, and getting more young people involved and speaking to issues that women care about. But also, I think women should feel a personal responsibility to engage their own networks. When you think about the influencers, I mean, there was a time when women would wait to see what their husband did, what their husband would tell them who to vote for. I think today with social media and networks that women have in communities like this, women know that they can make persuasive arguments and get their friends to feel a responsibility to do something beyond just talking about the problems of society. If you're not willing to get up and vote, I'm sorry, then you are part of the problem. And I have no trouble calling out people who didn't vote in 2016 people didn't vote in 2018, I said, you have foregone your right to complain about anything that happens if you didn't give a damn enough to get out and vote. So I think people should influence their own friends. Just some old fashioned shaming. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a mom. There's nothing more powerful than mom guilt. I, I, can, I can guilt anybody into what's wrong with society today because they didn't get up and vote. So just put me in a room with anybody and I'll make them feel really bad. Yeah, exactly. Very well said, Governor. Um, democracy is not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. And I will have to say I was guilty of not voting a lot. Um, my voter history is actually one of the things that almost hurt me during my campaign. But I kept saying there were no candidates that I could get behind. You know, it was like horrible candidate one, horrible candidate two. So I just wasn't interested. So that leads me to my next point, which of course I know you could speak on a lot more. But um, we have to make sure that we have the people who are involved and, and tapped into our communities voting. Like, uh, voting and running, actually running for office. Um, I had no political background before I decided to run. Um, my sister actually challenged me, um, and I always tell her I didn't know any better, so I accepted the challenge. And um, I'm here in the New York State Assembly, and every day I'm here, I'm like, I wish I paid more attention in AP government. <laughs> but, but you know what? I know that no one has the passion that I have to fix my community. So really, everyone and anyone can do that. And when we have candidates we can get behind, encouraging people to go out and vote really is a no-brainer. Yeah, there almost needs to be an amnesty for folks who haven't voted before, because I think it's like you can, um, you can always make up for it. And I do think this is gonna be a watershed election. Uh, and, and women will be the majority of voters again uh, in 2020. So something else I'm kind of interested because in, you all come from really very different backgrounds. You have different, you represent different districts. Um, Avery's obviously on campus. Um, Brett, I know you're talking to folks all over, uh, and, and Governor Hochul, you're all over the state. So every single issue that has been at the forefront of um, concern, protests, marches, whether it is defending the Affordable Care Act and access to Planned Parenthood, uh, whether it is the concern over family separation, what's happening at our borders, whether it's, frankly, common sense gun reform, which we know is so long overdue in the United States of America, uh, teacher strikes, three quarters of teachers in this country are women, and they've been on the front lines of dealing with fighting for public education, time's up. Um, all of these issues have really been w issues where women have been taking the lead. I'm curious what you're seeing right now for the women in that, you, that you interact with, whether it's on campus, whether it's in your district, whether it's all the places that you just listed a minute ago that you've been even just today, what's on the mind of women as we go into this next 12 months of this election? What are the things that you feel like we wanna make sure that we're hearing candidates talk about? I do hear far more about gun safety than I had in the previous years. And I think Thank we, goodness. I think okay. we, I think we hit a point. We hit a point yep. where it's saying we couldn't get it done after Sandy Hook. And if you live in New York State, you know that we have the most aggressive gun safety laws in the nation. And the governor stepped up and really 
force, to, you know, she, sheer will, uh, really made this happen with the support of the legislature, and we've been a role model for other states. But, but shame on Congress in that window of opportunity when it turns out when you survey NRA members, and the majority of them supported background checks, and we couldn't get that done after children were slaughtered in their classroom. So I think that we now have an awakening, and I think the Parkland young kids are what's firing me up as well, just know that a movement started of te because of teenagers who saw what happened in their school, and they've continued. So I think that's the one that I hear more about than I'd had in, heard in the past, and I hear about this all over the state. But certainly, uh, reproductive health. I mean, we didn't know how bad it would get. We all talked about, well, we could get a different presidency, we could end up changing the Supreme Court. Those aren't boogeymen anymore. It's, that's reality, right. and that scares the heck out of women. So again, we passed with the legislature and the governor. We fought to make sure we could codify Roe v. Wade, so just in case the crazies totally could take over Washington, and we're on the verge of that, uh, that we are at least protected here. But I don't want to have only one of 50 states feel like women are secure here. And I think these are the issues that women are talking about more, and it's almost the confluence of those two and the uh, cross-pollination where women are just getting fed up between the combination of these and realizing that they can't afford college anymore and the cost of living is so high, but also these ones that threaten their kids. Uh, gun safety is so important because kids in classrooms and kids on street corners and neighborhoods are in jeopardy of losing their lives. That's and, terrifying yeah, to moms. And the number of mothers and fathers who are saying now, the thought that they are sending their children back to school and the first thing they are being trained on is an active shooter, um, like what to do in the case of an active shooter. Assemblywoman, yeah, Jean-Pierre, what do you think? Just what do to you add think? to that, well, I mean, my daughter, she's three and I had to go through a whole process and learn how they do lockdown and the bars that they put up in the preschools. And that's, you know, that's frightening, you know, nowadays that that's the kind of walkthrough you're going when you're talking about engaging with classroom and teacher. And, you know, they're doing more um, family orientations now with families just to show how they do their lockdown procedure. And that's really scary. Um, and gun safety, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what community you live in now. All parents, all families um, are concerned with uh, keeping our streets, our churches, our schools safe. Um, and just to add to that um, is, you know, keeping our young people, particularly here on Long Island and our seniors, they're fleeing Long Island because the cost of living is just astronomical and you really can't own a home. You have people who graduate college and are living in their parents' basement and they, right. they're 30. They're, that's is that something issue. you hear about? I mean, I know on the road I hear a lot about housing affordability and the fact that it's, it seems like it's been this issue that's been simmering, but it is now an economic issue that I hear everywhere. It, do you feel like that's, that that's true? You hear that in your, in your district? Yes, and I, I mean, one thing that we are doing on Long Island now is building more um, workforce, and I think that we need to, to differentiate the two from workforce and affordability are not the same. Workforce housing are for professionals who are particularly Long Island, if you think of the medium income is 53,000, but you have, you know what they used to say on Long Island, we used to have pocket of poverty, now we have pockets of wealth. Yeah. Um, and people aren't making that anymore as an average when you're coming out of, out of college. So, I mean, we are doing workforce development, um, but there's a whole lot that we have to have conversations around uh, housing on Long Island and out the, throughout the state. Yep. So Avery, um, if you're getting these 17 year olds the right to vote, <laughs> what's the one issue that you feel like, besides just being you know, part of a, a democracy and, and having that civic right, what is the one issue you would say that you hear about um, on your college campus that we better make sure that we're talking about in this election? Yeah, so I was originally thinking gun violence, and I hate to be repetitive, but also I don't because this is such an important issue that it needs to be repeated as many times as possible until people will listen. So I just wanted to say I was at an event um, about a month ago now, and I got a notification from CNN about a shooting in, uh, at a garlic festival. And I have to say that I like I swiped up, right? We see so many of these notifications, and it's um, it's like... It, it really it really hurts me how many times these notifications pop up on my phone. And so I swiped up on this one. But then about two minutes later, I looked around me, and this was a, a student conference, and I look around me, and people are, like, there's panic on their faces, and people are picking up their phones and calling. And I was like, oh, my God, this is something that people are, you know, close to them. And so 
I realized that it was um, an event that happened where people were, like a large percentage of the people were from, from that conference. And that was, um, you know, I'd realized how important the issue was before, but that was when I was like, it hit much closer to home. So that was the first issue. But the second one is climate change. And um, as students, it's something that's been forced on us and we have to act now in order to counteract the things that have been put in place to kind of like prevent our healthy future, if that makes sense. Um, so that is probably the number one issue that I hear about, talked about on campus. Um, and so I personally am working on legislation in the state of California to increase the amount of education that students receive on climate change. So kind of like integrating the issue into our curriculum and then also, you know, kind of putting pressure on state government to, you know, put mandates on school facilities. Because if students see, um, you know, sustainable, uh, sustainable facilities on campus, they're more likely to encourage their parents to adopt those practices at home as well. So climate change definitely is the number one issue that I think people will be voting for, yeah. I would say I want to combine the two, workforce development and climate change. So as we are working to save our planet that is dying every minute. We have a lot of opportunities, especially in our underserved communities, for people to start being trained in jobs that are you know, being developed because of the issues with climate change. So anything from solar panels to um, composting, these are great industries for people to be trained on, for people to be a part of. There's a lot of money in the green economy. So just really combining those two things, um, I think those that would be just you know, just really progressive and, and innovative. And that's what we really need to get people excited about, being proactive and getting ahead of where the job market is going, especially as it pertains to healing our planet. So Brad, before, so last year, in 2018, um, a record number of women and people of color got elected to Congress, mm -hmm. yay, that was great. <laughs> um, and a lot of folks ran on healthcare affordability. And increasingly that is continues to come up as the number one issue, particularly for women voters. What do you think? What are you, you're gonna be training all these folks who are gonna run for office and get elected. Right. What are you, what are you uh, saying to them and what do you feel like they are, what, what are, what's on top of their mind? What I think, so at, at Eleanor's Legacy, we work at the state and local level and uh, really what's top of mind is this sort of general um, quality of life and, and passion for service and feeling as though we are sending our best to Albany, we are sending our best to the county legislature, we're sending our best to the town of Babylon, um, because there is this sort of unknown, right? We, there's the, definitely the conversation that happens in New York and in Albany about gun safety, about paid family leave and paid sick leave, which we've introduced in New York, and how to expand that and how to have our congressional delegation bring that to DC. Um, there's a lot of interesting and innovative legislation that's been happening in Albany, but they want to feel, and I think the women we talk to who are interested in running for office are just tired of turning on the TV, turning on the radio, Radio and hearing bad news, right? And feeling let down by leadership. And they feel as though it's their time and that they can get in there, that it's not a spectator sport, that they have the qualities to stand up and be interesting and innovative and progressive, um, whatever the day may bring, right? Whatever crisis might arise or whatever opportunity might arise, they'll find that silver lining and they want to push forward, whether it is in their town or their county, Albany or something greater. It's this sort of of X quality, this sort of like this feeling like that our government is ours and that we are sending people who can speak for us and will look after our best interests. It's sort of harder to define than, than a specific issue aside from the ones certainly that Evolve and talked about. Yeah. Well, I know we talked a little bit about that um, before we came out, just about the difference it makes to have people who look like you, can relate to you in, in office. And I was saying, I, I have gotten to know the youngest African-American woman to go to Congress, Lauren Underwood from Chicago. And if you ever get to hear her talk, we, we did a panel uh, or a, a conversation the other day in front of an audience. And after she talks about what it's like to be in Congress, everybody wants to run for Congress. <laughs> She's like, suddenly, oh, I can do that. And I think this whole idea of, I mean, demystifying what the job is, right? And I know, I mean, you all all have, you know, decided to make these, you know, make this, um, be, 
be public servants. Uh, I, I know I felt like having Tammy Duckworth, finally a sitting United States Senator, take her baby on the floor of the United States Senate and showing, okay, that's what a and Senator- having, having to get special permission. And having to get special permission <laughs> to do so. To do so, um, yeah. I, I just, I feel like this is this moment when so many women um, in particular and women of color are saying, I never thought I could run for office, but now, I don't know, I think I could do that. And so um, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you, Governor Hochul, I know that this is something like that, that you're um, really focused on and you have now started your own, I don't know if it's on Instagram or uh, whatever your social media channel on how does she do it uh, or how she does it. So to kind of demystify for folks how you do it. So tell us a little bit about that. And then I'd love to hear all of you say, like, what is it that made you do what you're doing or what can we do to actually help other folks um, know that we're out there to support them getting elected to have a, have a democracy that really represents the American people? I have felt as the highest ranked woman in state government, I've had a responsibility to go out and recruit other women. First of all, I'm sick and tired of being the only woman in a room, so it's yeah. personal. I wanna hang with some more women. Um, and every level of government I've been in from town board to county, I was the only county official, I was the only one in my town board. Uh, when I was in Congress, I was one of 19%, and, uh, and now I'm so happy Tish James got elected, so now 50% of our state officials are, uh, so, so I said, you know, yay. So I, I also feel a responsibility to go out and talk to them and break through all the um, images that they have and reasons why they say they can't run. Now, I'm not saying every person has to run, but at least... You know, most guys, if they're 18 and have a pulse, they think they can run for office. I mean, no offense to the men. But I've seen a lot of young men who are unbelievably unqualified, including a, a young man who wanted to run for town board when he was 21 in my hometown, had never gone to town board meetings, lived at home with his parents, didn't have a real job. And I was debating, do I run for town board? I'm 35, I was counsel to Senator Moynihan, I helped start businesses, I've been assistant activist, I've been protesting bad things since the Vietnam War, um, but I didn't think I could do it. I didn't have the confidence to run for the lowest level of government until this 21 year old showed up and says, I can do this. So that was my biggest aha moment in my life. And I said, you know what? maybe I can do this. And, and my, my kids were preschoolers and I dragged them knocking on doors. And the point is the two of us both won. There were two seats, the two of us won. And I tell this story because I say the person who was wrong in that scenario was not him because his confidence in himself was well-placed. He is now the CEO of a almost billion dollar healthcare organization. And he's one of my dearest friends. He's, he's brilliant. I just didn't think he was when he was 21. But. <laughs> But I was the one who held myself back, thinking I was gonna be behind the scenes. I'm a staffer, I write the speeches, I make the guys look good. I, I was a permanent staffer. And I realized how stupid I was. And I tell this story because I want other women, uh, particularly the women we work with in Eleanor's, Eleanor's Legacy, to talk about um, breaking through that. So I'm gonna just tell you very quickly three more reasons women don't run for office. That one I mentioned is confidence. The second one is cash. Women don't think it's polite to raise money. Your mom would say, no, you shouldn't be asking for money. Uh, I'm so happy you gave that statistic of more women opening their pocketbooks and not waiting for their husbands and you know, friends to do this. Uh, invest in women, invest in women. We need your support, we're not all rich. Uh, you know, the second one, the third one is the culture. A lot of women don't wanna be the only woman in the room. They don't wanna have all those battles, but the more women we elect here, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you broke down barriers for yourselves, but also the women who are watching to see, you know what, they did it. And the last one is childcare. A lot of women don't run for office because who's watching the kids? And I will just simply say that my kids were young. They put up with their mother being elected official for 25 years. They are very socially conscientious individuals. They, and I don't know what your politics are, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but a week doesn't go by when they don't send me a picture of them protesting the White House because they live in Washington. And I'm very, I think they turned out okay. Uh, so, so that's my measure of success. So I tell young women, you know, your kids are gonna be okay. Your job is to raise them to be good adults. You have to launch them. So don't worry if you're gonna miss a few teacher meetings and a couple of soccer games, they're gonna be okay. So Assemblywoman, because you have a history in politics and being the, the person supporting the person, how did you decide to make that switch? I didn't. So uh, I was like that permanent staffer too. And, um, and I think the biggest mistake women make 
is don't feel that they can be in that leadership role. Um, they feel that they're more comfortable um, in the back, um, writing this, the writing the talk, doing the talking points, organizing the events. Um, and it took me a while to convince, and I was actually very involved. I was on a um, the committee to actually find the candidate for the seat, <laughs> um, and and I just was like so disappointed in the 21 year olds that would show up for the screenings with no experience, no real heart, no passion, no organic um, feeling towards the issues that were important to the community that I lived in. Um, and that was when it really hit home for me sitting at that table, realizing that that person that's sitting there for that screening can be the person that has a major role in my life and my prospective family. But I said I have a three-year-old daughter when I first got elected. Um, I didn't have any children. Um, and my first year in office, and I got pregnant, and the first conversations that I had with some of the male counterparts in my district was, maybe you should run for a lower office where you can stay home. <laughs> and um, so you can take care of your daughter. Maybe that'd be easier for you. Um, but I'm here five years. My so daughter's proud doing of you. well. Yeah. Um, and you know, I take my daughter everywhere because, and I, she has a vocabulary out this door, um, she, and she is, she's a gift. And people are starting to now. I go to events. They ask, "Where's Gia?" You know, because they're so used to. But there were people, and sometimes I would want to say it wasn't the men who scringed and said, "Oh my God, she brought her daughter here." Um, and I think that we have to get away from that, not only as men, but as women. We have so much power than we think we have, we, you know, and I don't think we know the capacity of our power. We run our households. Why can't we run for office? Um, we take care of our household. Why can't we run for office? We do, we manage everything. Uh, why can't we run for office? So I say to say this, that uh, we have to stop saying no. And I was sitting on a panel at a, in a, at a bar association and this is, there was a woman who, um, she's from Brooklyn, um, she trains candidates as well, um, and she's a consultant, and she helps fundraise. And she said, women would say, you know, I don't really get into politics, and the question is, what is politics for you? You know, when we talk, Brett talked about quality of life, you know, is your, you know, your park being clean important to you? Is the road that you drive down, is that important to you? Is your school district, is that important to you? Uh, your community being safe, is that important to you? That's all politics. Um, and so we have to get away that the politics, you know, we always talk about Albany, three men in the room. Soon it's gonna be three women in the room. Um, and and we have to, it's, it's, it's our language, you know, our language, you know, triggers, um, stigma, it triggers the way we think and the things that we do. Um, so I think we as women too have to start changing our language and how we react even within our own household. Um, I think that's important. Yep. I love that. I love that you're taking your daughter with you. And I think this kind of, uh, Governor Hochul, to your point, is that because so many women now are saying, I don't know what to do. You know, I feel like I'm concerned about what's happening. And also, you know, what, are I, what am I teaching my children? It's like, I think what we teach our children is, it's not what we tell them, it's what they see us do. And so when they see, when your daughter is seeing you um, leading and you, it's that's that's how they learn. So. Um, it's not always easy. No, it isn't. It's not always That's easy. That's right. You know, my daughter was, I was nursing um, her first six months, and she traveled to Albany. And when I look back, and, and that's with any task we do as women, that was when, we, when we're, we're in it, we're in it. We just keep going. It's when we're reflecting, we're like, whoa, how did I do that? You know, how did I travel up every Sunday night with a playpen and everything? And, you know, and, and for me, I could do it because, too, I have support, family support. But what about the woman who doesn't have the grandma, the auntie? You know, I know I could leave my home and I don't have to worry about anything because I have a great, great dad and a great great family support system, but not every woman has that. So we have to pave the way and open the door and say, listen, it's not gonna be easy, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Avery, so I know you haven't run for office yet, but you're, but you're kind of in office, right? I mean, you are with the, tell, tell folks what you do yeah. with the student, yeah. Okay, so I always knew that I wanted to go into politics, right? And so when I would get the typical question, like, oh, so what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, I would like, you know, look up at them and be like, you know, I want to I wanna go into politics. And they would look down at me. It was usually, you know, maybe like an, somebody older. And they would kind of say like, oh, it's a nasty, nasty world. Are you sure? And I would look back and be like, mm-hmm. And so I think that like that kind of symbolizes what it's like for a lot of young women, a lot of young girls, um, is we see um, the media a lot. And what's broadcasted in the media specifically recently is a lot of sexual assault cases. And so it's a little bit disheartening to see that that is what the media is val uh, like valuing, not these amazing women that are doing work in politics, right? So I think, um, I, so for me, I thought, you know, I'm not gonna wait um, until I have a political degree to run for office, right? So I kind of thought that as a woman, I needed to get a running start, if that makes sense. So I ran for office when I was 16. Um, I was part of like a student council organization. It's called the California Association of Student Councils. And I was region three president, right? So I represented several counties in Northern California on a, uh, like a state student board. And then I did that for a year and then I ran for state president and that's the position I hold now. And I think that throughout that process, um, it was really important that I found role models, women role models in politics to follow. And for me, one of those was Kamala Harris. And so, you know, she was district attorney, general attorney and now running for president. And so I think that it's very important for young women, um, especially those who do want to go into politics, to see those people and see the ones that are succeeding and thriving and to know that yes, the media is focusing on that because that's what they think people want to see or that's what you know is gonna get them the most attention, but that's not what's most important. And I think that um, yes, honor everybody's story, and but just know that there is room to succeed, right? And so I haven't run for office yet, I don't know, but I will continue the work that I'm doing so far. And, and, and somewhere in the audience, your grandmother is weeping with, yeah. with uh, pride. So um, go Avery, Avery for president. Yes. <laughs> so tell, how, how'd you do it? Well, I came from a corporate setting. I'm a psychologist uh, by degree, and I decided that I wanted to support high net worth executives and um, just increase efficiency in their life and make them a lot more money because they didn't have enough. So, um, <laughs> and um, so eventually, my sister looked around at our community and she goes, "This community really sucks." She's like, "You know." Um, you get paid to fix things. She's like, come fix this community. And I was in a space where I was being abused at work. Um, I had to secure a performance coach. We were like in marriage counseling, my client and I. Um, we were not married though. Um, <laughs> and we were just trying to make things work and he was my polar opposite. He's Caucasian, he's like 6'2". Um, and he was um, an avid supporter of our president. And I remember when I made the decision to run, as soon as my sister asked, it just felt right. And I went to him and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run for office, but I want you to know that, you know, I have my personal assistant here and she's trained to support you. And he said, why are you running for office? You don't know anything about politics. Now, I don't, he didn't even know I had children. So he didn't really know much about me and nor did he care, which is fine. But um, I said to him, well, our, our president may not know that much about politics. He's like, yeah, but he's a businessman. And I said, and so am I, like I run your businesses. So he said, I'll give you my blessings. I was promptly fired the next day. And um, I don't know if you know how expensive it is to run a campaign against a 30 year incumbent, but let's just say it's upwards of $150,000. And um, I had none of that, especially losing my job. And um, I have to say I would do it again in a heartbeat because that situation proved that there's always going to be a need for people who care that's what it's about. People who care, and I think Rachel Maddow said it best, it's not red, it's not blue, it's who cares and who does not care. And one thing that um, uh, that position taught me was that if I could run 11 businesses for someone, I can definitely run for office. So that is how I did it, my Bravo. sister Bravo. and my client. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Brett, you can say whatever you wanna do, but also I just wanna make sure that, because 
um, this is such a great example of the women that are out there that need our support. So in, in addition to whatever else you want to say, yeah. I, I think it would be great to tell people here what they can do to actually help more women, more women of color, run for office, get elected to office, and then support them when they're there. That's be a tee up, right? Do you mean become a member <laughs> of Eleanor's Legacy, the only statewide organization recruiting, training, and funding Democratic women to local office? Because I would be happy to talk <laughs> to anybody who would like to become a member of Eleanor's Legacy after this. Um, she's not here this evening, but perhaps a few of you here know uh, Judith Hope, who is the founder of Eleanor's Legacy, and she was the first woman elected a uh, town supervisor uh, on all of Long Island uh, in 1975 when she was elected town supervisor of East Hampton Town. And uh, we were at an event yesterday, because it's the season out here on the East End, to find yourself at an event. And it was for Eleanor's Legacy. We were in Southampton. We were joined by the governor. And uh, I shared with everyone uh, yesterday that at Eleanor's Legacy, we run a campaign grant program. So when a woman runs for office, she asks us for our endorsement and grant, you know, sort of a, a, an investment in her campaign. And 191 women across New York State, uh, including many here in Suffolk County, have applied this year for Eleanor's Legacy campaign grant. So again, these are women running for town council, county legislature, town supervisor. Um, and they represent about 20, 25, if not a few more attorneys to be expected, right? Um, about 20 teachers, educators, professors. Um, business people, the, the sort of the regular gamut of the people here running, but here's the changing face of it. They also include three farmers, an epidemiologist, and one beekeeper. Oh. I know. <laughs> so these are women across New York who are sick and tired of being sick and tired, as Fannie Lou Hamer famously said, right? And they're ready to get involved, and they're ready to follow in the footsteps that generations of New York women have paved that way and continue to pave that way. Uh, forward for all of us and it's so interesting and exciting to see so you all should know that your New York State Legislature at this moment has the most number of women ever serving in it as Lieutenant Governor said yes <laughs> just two uh, just two of the women here today of the fantastic women and they're doing such interesting things uh, Kimberly Jean-Pierre the assembly member you mentioned the challenge of being a nursing mother and being on the road. Your job is half in Babylon and half in Albany. Um, but what you didn't share is that you were recently at the unveiling. Right. You were recently at the unveiling and fill in the blanks if I miss them of a uh, of an on the go. On the go um, so and hold your mic up. So I took a tour, and that's one of the things we get to do as a legislator. Cause, and when you have the personal experiences, you could put the personal touches. So we took a tour of the East Access, um, which would be the Long Island Railroad being able to be expanded in different parts of the city. Um, so one of the things uh, Neely Rozak and I talked about was how you know a lot of um, nursing moms who are nursing take the Long Island Railroad and are connecting to different parts so it's supposed to connect to the Amtrak and the PATH train. And how will you make it convenient and accessible? We do it in the airports. Um, we're starting to do it in the airports where we have a safe um, and a more private place where moms can breastfeed their babies. Um, so we just unveiled at Penn Station, there is a nursing booth um, at Penn Station in the waiting area. Because of my tour with Neely Rozick. Yeah. Yeah. So it took two women, two assembly women, going on a tour, uh, an infrastructure tour, right? Where I'm sure you had hard hats and boots and everyone was pointing out the, uh, you know, the safety measures and how deep you were digging those tunnels. And the two of you said, well, what about the women riding these trains that you're going to bring into the city? And how are we actually improving they, their lives? They were talking about UPS, um, uh, USB port, be charging Ooh, your phone so exciting. And, and all these techies things and we said what about the moms and um, so it'll be the first of many so the East Access Tour obviously is not complete yet um, but it, they started and they, sh they are showing um, they're sincere and that here it goes so again the organic um, approach towards people so and what people feel and what people care and what they need um, to be um, comfortable in this state it's just bringing a totally different perspective to, you know, elective office. And I just have to say this because I think, what a, to, you know, as much progress as we're making in some places in New York, obviously there's um, 
a lot of things happening that are taking us backwards. And I know today, I, I just, I read that Planned Parenthood um, has now had to drop out of the National Family Planning Program. They provide 40% of the services through the, the National Family Planning Program. Um, and it's because of this new uh, regulation by this administration. And so there are going to be millions of folks who are gonna lose access to services in many of them places where there are no other options. And so I firmly believe that when half of Congress can get pregnant, we will quit fighting about Planned Parenthood and abortion rights and all the other things that women need. But it is, it's, you know, it, this, is, this is a time, and I think this is the hard thing right now is the onslaught of all the attacks on, um, on people of color, on Im the Im immigrant community, on women, it's hard for voters to, you know, to focus. And it's hard to even pay attention. And as I think a couple of you said, it's hard to turn on the news sometimes. And so that's where I feel like you all play such an important role in helping people distinguish um, like what is actually happening in Albany, in Washington. What, you were gonna say something, yeah. I was going to say, this Something divisiveness is really not helping us as a country. You know, um, a lot of times people will hear things or they hear, hear the word diversity and think it's like a weakness. But diversity is a strength. It's it's that way in genetics. It's, it's that way um, in just the fiber of this country. So if we continue to be afraid, if we continue to fight against things that will help people, we are going in a direction that is really, really detrimental um, to say anything to a woman who, you know, she's responsible for bringing life, she's responsible for raising life. Um, men also use a lot of these services. You know, when I um, tour Planned Parenthood, I have, I have a really big facility um, near my house in Hempstead. And, you know, I have people of color who are concerned because they'll say things like, you know, this is about sterilization or it's here because they, they don't want us to have children. And, and honestly, the educational aspect in Planned Parenthood is, is the part that I hold most sacred because how many times have any of us and all of us in here done things because we were misinformed? And when we're dealing with our bodies, when we're dealing with each other, when we're dealing with epidemics, when we're dealing with these things, to not have a place to go um, to gain the right information in a safe space, I had no idea how many men utilize Planned Parenthood services. So we really need to be very careful about what we're fighting for, especially before we have these conversations to have a great understanding of a lot of the things that are offered. I just honestly feel like someone is pushing this divisiveness. And when you hear a bunch of screaming, you really wanna know why. Who's at the, who is at the root of that? So I thought what we'd do is actually, we've got some folks in the audience and maybe see if some people, you're such an amazing group of women. Um, I thought we just see if there are a couple of folks want to have ask questions. So, um, oh. great. Oh, there's somebody right there actually wants to ask a question. So introduce. I think we're going to bring you a mic and yeah. Mark Kessler, obviously not a woman. Um, Hi, Mark. But, but I'm behind. Her. Right. <laughs> Dragging me here. Um, you've talked exclusively about putting women in positions of power and that will change how the world perceives women, but you've completely ignored how do you deal with men and their perception of women, okay? Which is equally as important. Um, so Congress doesn't have to be 51% women to have women's issues appreciated and understood. Let's just um, try it. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's just an idea. But it's a good, you know, it's a great point. I mean, yeah. I'd love to, I, and I look, I think that's, it's absolutely true that, and, and I, I think it's important that we all know there are men who believe in women's rights, in women's representation. So this is not, and you're right, we can't get there on our own. Um, I will say personally, I, like, it's exciting to have six women running for president of the United States, showing that, Unbelievable. and that you're, and they're all very different. They have different points of view. And I'm thrilled that, Kamala Harris is talking about teacher pay and Elizabeth Warren is talking about every economic issue and Kirsten Gillibrand, our own senator, talking about reproductive health care access. It would be so exciting to hear the men running for president talk about these same issues. So I think it, there is ro room here for us to do um, more to encourage everyone to think of these issues as important. But you all obviously, I'll let you... I think yeah, I Governor Hochul's about yeah. to jump out of the chair yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Just, 
No, I'm glad you raised that because I'm not prepared to let men off the hook. Uh, we were talking about women because that was the topic we were told to talk about, but I, I would go on for another three hours about the responsibility that men have to make sure that there is a different culture. And whether it's in the workplace, I'll, I spoke at Accenture a couple weeks ago. I spent a lot of my time going around to industries where there's primarily you know, men dominating the, uh, the C-suites. I mean, very few places have a lot of women in executive positions. Accenture just named their first female CEO of a company of 500,000 people. So I was talking to all the women, firing them up about their role and their responsibility. A young man in the audience came up to me and he said, I'm 24 years old, I just started here. He goes, what should I be doing? And I said, I need you to call out bad behavior when you see it. You cannot tolerate your colleagues, when they talk about how a young woman works or looks and you know, what, what they think about her, what, what you did on a weekend with women, you should not, there's no place for that in civilized society and you could be start of a movement where men stand up and say, that's not acceptable, I don't want to hear jokes about women, I don't want to know about her anatomy and call them out. I want men to feel a responsibility to do that. I think there needs to be a check and balance, and I, I definitely agree. But I, I also believe that the more women we have, because um, we don't, we're not equal, um, and but the more we can learn from each other. And I think, you know, when we talk about diversity, uh, Taylor just mentioned, is that we learn from each other. And I think that the reason why you have some of these candidates, male candidates, not running on these issues is because they perceive it as a woman's issue. And when we talk about childcare, I'll tell you, my, my child's father will know, it's, childcare is not my issue, it's our issue. And we talk about childcare, we talk about economic development, we should be talking about childcare. We should be talking about, because we, we, we tend to separate the issues as certain issues being women issues and the hardcore work is the male issue. But we should learn from each other and I think it should be a check and balance where we can grow together and learn from each other. I think that is a really good point. Um, I was recently visiting a place for women who've experienced um, domestic abuse, and they had all these different programs and all these different interventions for the children and the women, and I kept asking, are the men ever looped into this? If they're the ones that are um, assaulting the women, are they ever looped into this? This is a learned behavior usually, um, especially if they have young male children. Are the men ever, because how are we gonna fix the issue if we are not addressing the person who is assaulting you know, um, the family? So I think that's really, really relevant. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think like a lot of the behavioral discrepancies that we're talking about between men and women is like a lot of the time linked to stereotypes. And so maybe some men have a stereotype of women and that stereotype is, you know, they don't belong in, in politics or whatever that stereotype may be. I think the best way to disprove that is to just prove them wrong in what they're seeing, right? And so maybe maybe you think we don't need 50% um, of Congress to be represented by women, but I think that that is the most effective way to kind of dis dispel these stereotypes, if that makes sense. Thank you, thanks for your question. That's a good question, yeah. I see somebody with, yeah, right there. Hi, thanks. Um, one of your first questions was about how do you get people to come to vote? And New York State is a closed primary state. So if we go back to 2016 in the, in the primary elections, and, we, and if you wanted to, and many people I know who are educated and were very involved with voting for, let's say, between um, Hillary and Bernie, and they needed to, and this election was in May for the primary, they needed to make that decision to pick their political party by October. That's almost like six, nine months prior to this election. Now, New York State has to be the most conservative state when it comes to this. And there is a movement to make this an open primary state. Even California, you can go and you can change two weeks prior to the political party that you choose and be able to vote. If you register to vote, um, <clears throat> there is nowhere on that registration that states that if you uh, get yourself, if you choose to be an independent, 
that you will not be able to vote in a primary. People don't understand this. This needs to be out there. You want people to vote. You need to get this out in the public, and we need an open primary in New York well, State. Could you, could you, could you, one of you share the new legislation? Well, we are delighted to report that under the new leadership in the New York State Senate, meaning Democrats now control it, uh, we actually had uh, groundbreaking legislation enacted this year to cr increase voter participation. We had the stigma and the shame, in my opinion, of being 38th in the nation in terms of voter participation. Uh, that hurt me deeply as the birthplace of the women's rights movement and all the other causes and civil rights and every, a lot of movements, the fact that people in our state didn't participate. And I'm not saying it was their fault. I think the system was, you know, to quote Bernie, the system was rigged uh, in a way that did not make it easier. So we now have early voting, first time ever. We allow have early voting. We'll have. You can register to vote when you're 16 years old when you go in to get your driver's registration. So you'll be all set there, get your license. Uh, we now also allow for uh, no longer do you have, to, and that was embarrassing that you had to have known your party affiliation and who you wanted to vote for months before the primary. So we've now changed the timetable and all that. So, so we still have some more reforms to do. We're not finished. But you're going to see, I hope, a dramatic change in participation because we've made it a lot easier on people. So uh, uh, your point is excellent, and I think we're on the path to making sure that we start moving up in terms of getting New Yorkers able to participate in, in electing their leaders. That's great. Um, it's a great question, I think, that, and this is a great fix. I, you know, I spent some time this cycle, um, last cycle with Stacey Abrams uh, in Georgia, and and uh, I firmly believe, and a lot of people in Georgia believe, that if all the votes had been counted and everyone had been allowed to vote, she would be the governor of Georgia today. Um, and so I'm so glad that she is raising the issue of, because of course we can make 17 year olds eligible to vote, but then if they actually can't vote where they live or they can't vote where they go to school. And so I do think this is something that, it's great that New York can lead the way, but we need national voter registration. We need to change this for the whole country because if each state is changing it, state by state by state, we're not gonna get there. And um, so thank you for leading the way, but I think it's something we have to commit to as a country, as something that is a priority for our, to have a real democracy. So, um, and I think, um, who else, we got, there is somebody, are you, actually my friend here is choosing, great. Talking about voter participation, particularly in New York, because we are known as a quote unquote blue state, there are many people who don't vote because they don't think that their vote counts, regardless of the party, even if they were, you know, Democrats. How do we counter that? What do we do to get more participation that we're not only a blue state? Well, you might be surprised to hear me say that getting involved and pointing out that your local and your state elected officials have just as much, if not more, control of your day-to-day -day life, and that perhaps if you are in a blue state or a blue congressional district, you're probably, until very recently, but even still living in a red, if you will, uh, state senate district and what that did in Albany for thwarting and traffic jamming and log jamming actual progressive change for decades until the 2018 election. Or you're probably living in the town of Hempstead, uh, which is within a blue congressional district partly, but uh, the assembly member can talk more eloquently about it, but your town supervisor um, and your town council are, n are, are, are where your vote goes even further and you're being underrepresented and perhaps, perhaps mi misrepresented. I think breaking in my perspective and in my, um, perhaps the council member over B that I see in the back there can talk some more about it afterwards, but um, breaking it down to what matters on the local level and making it really realistic and and um, connected to people's day-to-day -to -day lives. It's a challenge because our conversation, very, very rightly so, and no denying it, is often at the national level and the news is at the national level, but our lives are at the local level. And bringing those two together and seeing how they work together, seeing that the momentum that we build to 
I would say, elect women to build a matriarchy at the local level in the local election years feeds directly into the national elections and congressional and federal elections that happen 12 months later. And that they themselves in turn feed the energy and feed the power for the local elections that continue the year after that. And it just builds and beads on, um, uh, uh, grows on each other. But that's my answer, is to break it down and make it seem real in their lives. I'll just address that quickly. I spent an enormous amount of time on Long Island, Westchester, the five boroughs. But there is another whole world out there. Uh, my former congressional district that I lost by 1.5% because I refused to vote to repeal of the Affordable Care Act just had a survey and 81% of the individuals in that district, my home district, my old district, would vote for Donald Trump. Um, so that is in the home state of New York. New York. So I think it's... Brett hit it right on the head. When you're voting for president, you also are voting for your assembly member, your senator, your member of Congress, and possibly a, a U.S. senator. So if your framework is my vote doesn't matter, you are wrong. And you need to get help get that word out to people who may not understand that you're not just voting for one election. You're also trying to make sure that there's more Democrats in Congress. So in my opinion, we can continue to have someone known as Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's out there you know, holding the, the tides back against insanity in our nation's capital. And my God, we've got to keep Democratic control there. Same thing with our Senate. Uh, all the accomplishments we've been able to talk about. And we can do another whole session on how extraordinary this year has been to protect reproductive health and, and transgender rights and countless others. Uh, that can go away like this. If we didn't have the, the Long Island Six elected during uh, the last election, you know, we're back to where we were just a few months ago, a year ago. So I think that's important. It's not just presidential you're voting for. There's a lot of down ballot races that are the difference of, of life and death. They truly are. And I think the exciting thing is now people are competing in those races. And I think with 40,000 women who've raised their hand to say they want to run for office, it means you can't let any office be uncontested. And that is really how we build a farm team. So, absolutely. Maybe we have time for like one or two more questions. Anybody? I saw someone back there. Hi. Hi. I recently ran for a local office and was lucky enough to win. But thank you. I, Let's give it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> It's true. No, women, re women really did lead it. But I, too, was challenged to run. And my challenge, the way I was challenged was I was told, it takes a woman six times to be asked to run before she says yes, and it takes a man once. And I said, damn, I'm running. Yes. 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 So exactly. how, do we, how do we ask them over and over? How, do we, how does everybody here ask the women in our lives to make sure that we do get more women out there and more women running? The way I phrase it is, have you thought about running for office? Uh, and uh, no lead up, no run in. You are talking to her. She strikes you as smart. Uh, uh, and, and you just go for it. Um, I, uh, there, there's, sort of, there's, no, there's no other magic. Although everyone here has talked about how they either had to convince themselves or they had to be on the search committee and realize that they themselves were the quality candidate that they were looking for. But part of me is torn, frankly, even about repeating that statistic about a woman being asked six times. Even though it's the lived experience, I feel it's changing. That ground is changing right beneath our feet. I feel like 2016, November 8th, 2016, and the entire experience of 2016 was one big ask. And it's continued to be one big ask our country, and I'll even, I'll even grant my sisters on the other side of the aisle the grace to say our country is crying for us to step forward. They're crying for a change in the face of power, a change in the conversation. I'm so excited to see what's happening in Albany. I'm excited to know that there's a sister on the other side all the way in California who's about to start her journey as a voter, to know that there's no end in sight, that it's not a wave, it's a, it's a wave that with no crest. There's no bottom or top to it, that there's just more and more pushing it higher and higher. And I, and I think I'll just add to that. Um, I actually, before I, before I ran, I, when I was a permanent staffer in my mind, um, and I went to an, um, a workshop run by a former congresswoman, and she runs this organization, She Who Runs. And um, so it was a room filled with women, 
And the question was, well, I know you probably haven't decided that you wanted to run, but if you ran, if you were in student government, um, or if you were in any organization in your school where you were a leader, stand up. And the room was filled. Everyone, yep. majority of the women stood up because there's a gap. When we're in grade school or in college, we feel like we can do it all. But then when we leave college, that that level of or that competence where we can run for office or be in an executive office for some reason just goes out the window. Yep. And we have to figure out what's the cause of that. But don't you find, and I mean, I feel it right now, I'm just like so excited, some of you I didn't know before, the joy that women are taking and the success of their sisters and other women is palpable. And I do think part of this is, I don't think people do things um, just because they should do them. They also do things because they believe this is actually gonna be a joyful thing. And I love the spirit that. that you're bringing to yeah. elective office. Yeah. So I definitely wanna say, Kimberly Jean-Pierre is a gift. Um, every time we, I mean, I think I had just won the Haitian election. Sensation. Haitian <laughs> sensation, definitely. I had just won the election and we met each other at SOMOS in Puerto Rico and I think I was like sleepwalking through SOMOS and I saw her and she gave me the biggest hug and kiss. So I was showing my friend all of the Kimberly Jean-Pierre and Taylor Darling pictures and their live photos. So we're just like hugging, like I'm so happy to see you. And we found out we were on the panel together and we were so happy. And I think that um, that support is real and that support is something that, um, that encourages people to join. It is a sisterhood, you know? We have our Women's Caucus in Albany. We have our Black Caucus in Albany. So you have all these groups that really want to um, support you and encourage you and develop you. And it is very infectious, you know, because we do understand that um, together we can do a lot more. And not to speak about specific legislation, but I just, I have to publicly thank you, Kimberly Jean-Pierre, because I represent Hempstead School District. And for anyone who lives on Long Island and has heard of Hempstead School District, you know the dire, dire need for monumental change there. We really have children who are literally suffering and dying um, right here in our own backyard. And I had spoken to Kimberly in conference and I said, I don't think this legislation is gonna go through. It was a day before the last day of session. And she looked at me and she said, okay. And she said, well, I'm trying to do something with wine dance as well because they're suffering and we're having financial issues. And um, I had kind of like, maybe given up a little bit and I was exhausted. So I went back to my hotel room and the speaker's people called me and they're like, the speaker needs to see you. So I quickly threw something on and I was like, okay, what's going on, what I do? And he goes, um, are, are you trying to like fake pass legislation right now? And I knew only one, I only spoke to one person about that particular um, uh, legislation. And you know what, because of Kimberly and, and that sisterhood and her willingness to speak up for both school districts, we were able to pass legislation unanimously in the assembly and um, hopefully the governor signs it. But it was just something where I just said in the, in the 11th hour, just that sisterhood right there, you know, had she not mentioned it, this would have been something I'm dealing with. There are 150 people that are speakers and or 149 that he's responsible for. So there are a lot of issues, but our issues, our education, that is the most important thing. I think that's why it's one of the largest parts of our budget. And um, to just have someone advocating for you on the inside is really huge. I just want to thank you so much for that. Love the children that. of Hempstead and Wine Dance. Well, I'd also say that the, uh, I think what you're hearing is these are not one-offs. This is how it is when women are elective office. There's none of that competitiveness and there's only so many spaces at the, in the corridors of power, one seat at the table, and I want to make sure if she gets it, I won't get it. Yeah. There's none of that uh, because women truly do know what each other had to go through to get where they are. Yeah. Uh, they know the sacrifices and they, and they thrive on the passion of each other. I love listening to them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm the president of the Senate. When we had a new wave of young women elected the Senate, I feel like, I mean, they're like my daughter's age. I'm like taking, okay, now I gotta tell you what to do now. And I take them out and I'm kind of counseling them. And here's how I'd give a speech. I said, you did pretty good, but don't read your notes. Try to, you know, I try to help people and I, and I give them comments and, on their speeches on the floor. And you mentioned my hashtag, how she does it. You know, people wanna know how I do different things and some of it's lighthearted, some of it's pretty serious, how you deal with criticism, everybody commenting on your looks and your clothes and oh my God, I didn't know you're so short and you know, all these comments <laughs> like, yeah, okay, I'm a little vertically challenged, deal with it. Uh, but I, I just think I wanna just tell my stories just to say, you know, 
I'm no different than any of you. You know, my parents used to live in a trailer park and my dad worked at the steel plant. I mean, we all come from different stories, but no one has a monopoly on passion. I mean, there's no one more passionate than the one we have running for office. And I, I always give my hat off to Judith Hope and Brett for, for giving people the tools they need. But Mayor, when you, congratulations on your election. Yeah. I don't ever want to hear again it takes that long to get a woman to run for office because I find that offensive. It's like we're sitting around like Cinderella, like, oh, please, please come to me and give me this little slipper and ask me to be your princess. Forget that crap. I mean, women just should know, like, in your heart, you're better than somebody else, okay? Who but you should get out there and save the community for your kids and eventually save the planet? That's the passion that women have, and we need to harness that and let them know that we can, we've broken down the barriers, and we're going to help the sisters break down even more. Awesome. All right. Well, please thank this amazing panel of leaders. Um, you're incredible. Give it up for them. Thank, thank you so much to our panel and to everybody for coming out tonight and also supporting the series over the last three weeks. It's really been tremendous. And we will continue the discussion right next door. Um, if you'd like to join us for a glass of wine or some water and snacks, please, please join us. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.